This is a subject that we've been talking about for a long time. These reports that we do um, come from PMMI, which is the association, if you're familiar with PAC Expo, that runs PAC Expo. So we do a lot of research, um, many different topics. Recently, it's all been very directed towards automation. We just finished a significant report. I gave a presentation yesterday on robotics, which is somewhat included in this report as well. We'll definitely touch on robotics. It's hard to talk about automation and not talk about robotics. That's really a, a key point of, of the automation picture. So this report, what, what we did with the NFPA is um, we took the automation report and we did further research for them specifically in the topic of pneumatics. How does automation and pneumatics play together? So we're using part of their presentation as well. And then, like I said, I have incorporated some of the updated information that we know about robotics into this report. So it's kind of a combination of several different topics. But we certainly know that, that technology today, it's, it's advanced, it's advancing manufacturing, and, and there's no stopping the technology that's coming. It, it's on its way. You need to make sure you've got a ticket on the automation and robotics train because it's leaving the station. So who is behind the voice of this information? Um, if we look cumulatively at all the reports that we've got going, really about 180 participants, and these are direct interviews that we speak to um, end users, we speak to contract packagers, we speak to the robotic manufacturers, the systems integrators out there, we talk to the OEMs, we talk to design engineers, the technology providers, the, the people who are um, designing this technology and bringing this technology forward. And we look at the industry experts. We talk to a lot of schools, the academics out there, the people who are really behind some of this innovation. When you look at the industries that we speak with too, it's, it's a wide list of industries. You know, the top 10 anywhere from food, automotive, pharma, beverage, medical, personal care, consumer products, so this really encompasses all of our CPG companies, our automotive, our industrial companies, and then we go out into the, the marketplace and we see what is everybody saying about this. So there's many, many references and reports and other people's opinion and, and papers and technology papers that we look at to bring in a collective voice in an industry for this report. So if we look at advanced automation today, it really is just that method of collecting and analyzing, storing, and utilizing the information from a manufacturing floor of any type. Even from um, automotive all the way down to food, to pharma, anything, of, and all of our products that are, that are being made today. And it's really taking place everywhere. It's in, in every company voicing plans for greater automation. We hear everyone is on board, they're moving forward. And you've got your larger companies that are certainly going to be further along than your smaller companies. I know you heard a presentation yesterday about robotics and how it's helping small and medium-sized companies. Absolutely, our findings are exactly the same. So there might be a little bit of overlap with some of that today, but it just reinforces the, the importance of this technology. So we were asked to look at where are we right now? That's sort of the green part. And, and where are we going to be in five years? And where are we going to be in 10 years? And, and there's a purpose why there's no statistics on this chart, because it's really a moving target. How, we don't know exactly what technology is going to move faster. It depends on the company. Some companies are further along than other companies. But certainly, it, it's all moving forward in terms of machine automation and, and acquiring the data from these machines, calculating OEE, the whole um, overall equipment effectiveness, and process optimization, that's what's driving a lot of this, to be more efficient. Line integration, you would think that most companies have this underway. There's a lot of companies that don't. There's some that have it already perfected and their lines are totally integrated. And the whole predictive maintenance part of it and the, and the um, 
predictive and productive maintenance of it. And then when we look at what's the goal, it's really to become a full IIoT operation where you're collecting the data, you're analyzing the data, you're using that data to help you make projections of the future, you're doing predictive maintenance, you're doing remote access, all the things that now make you a, a completely digital operation. So some of the buzzwords we do here, the IIoT, the Industrial Internet of Things, which is also Industry 4.0, big data analytics, artificial intelligence that we hear, we'll touch on that a little bit, machine learning, which is being driven by AI, the whole digitalization process, augmented reality, virtual reality, augmented reality certainly helping with the maintenance that's going on in the industry, and e-commerce, which is all of us here, we're doing that. We get on our phones, we order, we want it now, we want it customized, we want it in different configurations. That's something that's really driving this entire change. So we looked at some independent surveys as well, just to get an idea of, are we on track? And they're saying that most people in the next average of eight years are gonna realize the full potential of this whole digital transformation. That's a pretty short time frame. Some companies are probably already realizing it, but some might not yet for another eight years. Eight years seems like a long time for the technology advancement, but it's definitely coming. So I like to look at this as being like a marathon. Everyone is signed up to run this race, but it depends on where you are in your skill set. You might be a leader, so you're at the front of that race, you might just be getting ready to cross the start line, but you're in the race. And then when you look at all of those people spread across any type of a, a marathon race path, everyone's gonna be at different speeds. Some people are gonna go faster at times, some people are gonna go slower. It's the same thing with adopting automation. Some are gonna move very quickly and be your early adopters, and some of them are going to just be coming behind at the end to actually look and watch how the leaders are performing and learn from them. So it's, it's a wide spectrum of where different companies and where your customers and where your companies could be at. So how do you begin to say, how do we get started? So you have to really look at where are your pain points? What business do you wanna achieve? What outcome do you want? Where are your bottlenecks? To be able to begin to look at where do I even start to implement automation in a company? Identify what some of the production limitations might be. Where could you improve production and bring in automation or bring in a robot or bring in a cobot that could help you either with throughput or advancing um, worker safety? There's many different aspects of where you could start that. And then really evaluate, do you have the skills inside to be able to do this, or do you need to partner with technology suppliers, with OEMs, with other experts out there who can help guide this path of where you start, what do you do, and how do you get going? We heard a couple comments when we were um, speaking to people about the robotics report is they really want people to come, they want their suppliers and their OEMs to come and stay and don't leave until we're 100% up and running and we've got it and you've trained us and we're ready to go. So certainly data empowers possibilities. The whole advancement of 5G coming is gonna to continue to move this um, automation robotics forward. Um, it's it, it's gonna be needed for the speed, for real time, for corrective action, for it to be able to collect data on a machine, send that data out, and somebody's seen that in real time, be able to make corrective action. So there's some um, outside operational things that are happening that are also driving this. And if we kind of look at it, it puts it in perspective. We're about seven, over seven and a half million people in the world, growing at about 1% a year. But when you're looking at the data connections of this, there's 11 billion connections already in 2018. Over 300 million added every month. This does not include our cell phones. It's forecast to be 50 billion by 2020. That's only six, seven months away. So the speed at which the device and sensors and connectivity is going on is, is pretty tremendous. And I put that little cybersecurity 
uh, icon down at the bottom because that's got to always be in the back of everyone's mind, both personal and business-wise, in terms of you start moving and collecting data and moving that data to the cloud. Now you've opened up um, your whole production facility to ha be hacked or have a cybersecurity attack. So it's not something we get into in this report. There's an entire report PMMI has out about that, but it's something to certainly think about as we advance automation. So what are some of the challenges as we're implementing the whole digital process and the whole digital pr transformation? So if we look at the learning curve of technology, that it really is a learning curve. But we know that capital budgets are increasing. We hear it continuously in all of our research. We know there's a lack of labor. That's not something that's going to be solved quickly. Um, it, it evolved over many years. It's going to take that same amount of time for it to somehow even out. But that's a big part of what's driving automation. Uh, Amazon just announced yesterday, I mean, you're, we're in the midst of all this. So the news and the information that's coming out is daily. Amazon just announced that they are, they are definitely moving forward in an aggressive way with automation and robotics at all of their warehousing. They're adding more warehousing all the time. So that whole Amazon effect, um, they can't find the labor that they need. And then the labor that comes, they have such a high turnover that they are now aggressively looking towards automation and robotics in their manufacturing facilities. That's a pretty big statement for Amazon to be moving in that direction. When they were very people heavy, they're going to now really be turning more automation and robotics heavy. We know the engineering staffs in some of these um, companies, particularly your CPG companies, is declining. It's harder to find those engineers. I know that a lot of you here are, are in that field. Um, you're in high demand, so you're in a good place. Um, repetitive tasks are being replaced by robotics, and certainly whole, the whole data acquisition is advancing rapidly. So we spoke to each of the groups. What are they challenged with? What do they say they need? It really all revolves around cost justification, workforce education. We need to upskill the people that are there, and having open communication so that these platforms can talk across each other. The end users say that really their biggest challenge is justifying the expense. ROI is significant. How companies are calculating it is kind of different across the board. What are they challenged with? The OEMs say they need to encourage a better vision at the top. They need companies to continue to approve the budgets that are going to advance automation. The technology suppliers say we need to educate the industry. We understand that we have introduced concepts, AI, machine learning, digital twinning, things that are out there, the technology is available, but now educating the industry of how to use it and how to implement it and how to adopt it. But it's a gradual process. As I said with the marathon, IIoT, it's a gradual process of adoption, both with CPGs and OEMs. There's high costs that are driving it and the lack of skilled labor, which is continuing to drive it. So we looked at, with, when we did this process for the um, NFPA, we looked at like how pneumatics are playing in this as well. But we know that the reasons for some of this slower adoption, um, there's a need for smarter pneumatics and vacuum components, as there are for smarter of all components. But we particularly looked at, for the NFPA, where does pneumatics play in this part? We know that robotics, all, most all robotics have some form of either pneumatics or fluid power in it. So if you see that uptick coming in robotics and cobots and automation, then there is also an uptick coming in that industry specifically related to automation and robotics. There's a high cost of implementing these solutions, so certainly that's a hindrance behind it. And there's unproven technology yet. Some of this is still being proved and understanding it and how do you adopt it. As we go month by month, more and more of this is being um, adopted and, and tested and proven. So it just continues. The train keeps moving. So end users really need to balance cost and value when they're using any kind of air technology or pneumatics um, to be connected to the IIoT in the future. 
some of the reasons that are driving the um, embedded intelligence in pneumatics and vacuum applications, better data collection, we know that. Preventive maintenance, certainly. Less downtime, more uptime. That uptime is anything that a company wants to look at. Remote servicing and monitoring. More efficient machines, more efficient operations, more efficiency on the plant floor. And the whole lifetime analysis of um, OEE and, and total cost of ownership. So with this, service expectations increase. You've got to be able to have local support, competitive pricing for all of your aftermarket parts. Um, parts have to be in stock. You have to have faster delivery. Everything is faster, faster, faster now these days anyway. So having that, it's the same with all components, but we look specifically at pneumatics in this. It's, it's the same thing. They need smarter components. They need it to be connected, and they need to have it be available. So it's really digital everything, and predictive analytics certainly is requiring more operator training to understand how to learn it. And remote servicing is gaining traction. We'll look at that a little bit closer here in a minute. So what are the things that end users, when I'm, and I'm speaking of the end users, it's the users of your um, either machines or your components or your technology. It's the people making the products out there. So what are they looking for? More interactive, intuitive HMI. This is a technology that's already here. It's already available. It's being adopted widely to be able to have that HMI where it gathers everything you need and it even now has all the service manuals. It has training. It collects all the data. It's sort of the, the whole heart of the operation. So that was really number one that they were looking for. And that, that technology is coming. And smarter sensors, certainly. Safety improvements, they need to make sure that any automation or robotics that they bring in is going to be worker safety. They want a standard communication. They want to be able to communicate across platforms with this. They want software compatibility. Certainly clean in place for those industries, pharma and food and beverage that have to have um, really clean, uh, sterile environments. Integrated condition monitoring, fully integrated connectivity, things all that, that they're wanting. In the OEMs and the technology suppliers, they're providing these solutions. They're out there, they're available. Like I said, we're not going to be stopping technology. So what are some of the opportunities that we can look at? Um, so functionality improvements that OEMs are asking for. So we asked the OEMs, what do they need from their pneumatic suppliers to help them implement and, and provide smarter machines, predictive analytics, wireless connectivity, and remote monitoring. Those were the top three things that they were looking for in terms of helping them bring intelligent features that are needed in pneumatics and vacuum components, um, autom autonomous maintenance, cleaner hygienic design, same type of things that the end users are looking for, easier to use. So some of the pneumatic components um, that are moving to smarter components in the future and, and are here, when we say future, that doesn't mean far in the future. That means sometimes that technology is already available and being implemented. But um, valves, actuators, cylinders, I mean, all of the components that are being driven by air. We did a report one time for um, a company, a compressor company, and we went out and we asked companies how much do you rely on your compressed air in your facility? And we were a bit surprised at how significant manufacturers still rely on compressed air. So pneumatics is something that is here. It's part of robotics. It's part of automation. And, and having those smarter components now is, is bringing it all together. So the use of pneumatics and vacuum components like I'm just saying, they're always going to have a place in manufacturing. So we asked the OEMs, where do they see this growing? Now, we had a significant portion of the OEMs say they see that that part of the component is declining, moving more towards servo or, or smart, the combination of servo and pneumatics together. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going away. It means that the as those technology and, and all of your suppliers here today, um, 
bringing that smarter technology to pneumatics is what the industry is really looking for. So we looked at servo pneumatics, which I think it's kind of got an odd place. It, it's not being used a lot. It's got some very specific applications, um, gaining some traction in pick and place, cutting, positioning, rotating, some of the operations and some of the applications where it's been used in the past, um, but they're looking for a little bit more precision. So some of those applications are looking at that servo pneumatics uh, technology. Increased versatility and also declining costs. Um, the price point is coming down for servo pneumatics, so maybe that's something that companies and OEMs will continue to start looking at. So I talked about capital budgets. This is a subject that obviously everyone wants to know, is there gonna be increased spending? So behind all this desire for more automation and desire for more robotics, are they putting budgets behind it? And, and we continuously hear, yes, they are. Some companies even have specific budgets just for automation. Um, and what's driving some of that? They really need to keep up with demand. Throughput is, is significant for some companies. They can't even get product out the door fast enough. You probably heard yesterday with your smaller and medium-sized companies, if they get a big order, and for them to have to turn that order away because they don't have the manpower to get it out, that's where automation and robotics now can step in and help a company of that size get a big order and get that order out the door and help them grow. And it's really kind of a collaboration. So it's not taking the employees away, it's bringing in the automation component that's gonna help them increase their throughput and help them increase worker safety and help them increase just the, the, the work cell in which they, they work in. Um, reduced operating costs is also behind it. Loss of labor, we, we hear about that. In fact, we hear about it so continuously. Preventing waste, being able to have new product processing to be able to bring a new product into your process much easier. Reducing packaging. Um, new package designs continuously happening all the time, particularly with the whole e-com phenomena that's going on. You'll see a product that might be different on the shelf that might be different from what's delivered to your door. Um, one of the companies that has really been um, highlighted of doing this is, is one of the detergent companies where they have their plastic container on the shelf, which you bring home, but now they have designed a completely new product for e-com. So it's a bag in a box. So they've eliminated the weight, they've made it more consistent, they've changed the graphics, so that you, if you've already made your decision online of the product you're going to buy, that product doesn't necessarily have to come in the way that you see it on the retail shelf. It's really causing a, a, a complete change of how CPGs are thinking they have to produce their products. So there are multiple sizes. I mean, that's us as consumers. We want it in all different sizes. And then the retailers want it in all different pack configurations. So it's really causing shorter runs where automation and robotics is something that, that can really pick up and help with that efficiency. So machine data and automation. Um, pneumatics is now targeted for being smarter components throughout manufacturing. Almost, as I said, almost all manufacturing plants rely on compressed air. Some of the things that they're looking at being material handling, processing and assembly, packaging, warehousing. Warehousing particularly is really seeing a growth in automation and robotics where they, they can't find the people, they don't have the labor, the jobs are not safe in terms of um, repetitive tasks. And the whole robotic end effector, which is where pneumatics plays a big role. Um, there's a, a technology out now that, that, that's pretty phenomenal in terms of this whole faster changeover. All um, manufacturing plants, want, they don't want to have time. They want to be able to move faster through changeover. That where the robot can, if you have a totally connected line, that robot can understand what's coming down that line and change its own end effector, go to its toolbox and realize what does it need to have to be able to now handle the product that's going to be coming down the line. So this is not widespread adoption, but this technology is available. As technology becomes available, then we know it's gonna be implemented. 
So digital twins, as we've talked about, in terms of improving machine design, um, also helping with remote access. In the recent report that we just did, we heard that about 40% of OEMs are, are really engaged in using digital twinning, and only about a third of end users are using it. So there's certainly a, a tremendous um, white space for growth in, in what digital twinning can do. And, it, and digital twinning is that um, capability to look at a machine remotely and understand it. you're looking at the exact same machine in real time and you don't have to necessarily be there for so remote access it's really helpful as well as design. In drones, um, certainly bringing a, a totally new perspective to the industry, going where um, it's hard for a human to go and look at inspection. You know, we've heard about drone delivery and, and that's something there's some skepticism out there that that will actually take place. But we know that something will change in that last mile of delivery and it's where automation and, and robotics is going to take over. There's already drones that are going through um, warehouses and collecting inventory where it might have taken a, a human a week to go through an inventory product in a warehouse, it can take a drone now several hours doing the same job and be much more efficient at it. And sound activation and monitoring, we know that you know we've got Alexa, we've got our phones, everything talks to us now. That same technology will be moving into the manufacturing sector to be able to talk to a machine and that machine can actually respond back with start, stop, slow down, be in safe mode. So voice activation is something that's, um, again, not widespread use, but the technology in, in moving advancement in manufacturing. So what kind of skills are gonna be needed? You know, we hear about the lack of labor, but we still need um, problem solvers and we need intuitive thinkers and, and trained specialists. Um, the advanced technology engineer who, who's gonna to have to understand AI and PLC expertise and, and be a critical thinker and, and collaborate and, and the technology operator, the person who's actually going to be operating that machine has got to have a much higher level knowledge of what that machine is doing. Advanced process controls and industrial and production engineering, robotics, data science, electrical networks, they're going to have to understand a greater level of upskilling these, um, these tasks. And being the maintenance technician, you're gonna, if you come in, they, they have to be able to understand all of the automation that's on the, this machine. Is it got AI? Does it have, uh, is it collecting data? What sensors does it have? It's, it's all going to have to be upskilled in terms of what kind of technicians are going to be needed in the future. So these are jobs when we hear that maybe automation and robots are taking jobs away but it's creating new jobs that maybe we don't even know in the next few years we're gonna need. So it's, it's just shifting. We're, we're in the midst of this tremendous transformation in terms of old jobs being lost because they aren't needed anymore, but new jobs being created because we have new things now to do. Wearables, a lot of this is happening in the warehouses to be able to help with um, augmented reality glasses or say you're a technician and you're at a site and you don't know exactly what you're looking at, you can have smart glasses on or you can actually contact somebody that might have a better understanding of this or you can look at schematics right there so you can see it right in front of you. So it's really, again, advancing the, and upskilling what the technicians can learn and be, be doing. Wearable scanners, handheld, all things that are making it easier for workers to be more efficient and throughput to go through quicker. And, and we all order from Amazon and we want it in 24 hours and these are some of the technologies that um, are making that available. And then certainly the whole um, ectoskeleton type robot that is um, helping assist lifting. So if you're in a warehouse, you, you can put on a, a, a suit that will help you be Superman in essence um, and be able to lift heavier objects um, assist. This is certainly uh, in, in our personal lives, it's an area that's significantly growing as well. So what are some of the technology assisted manufacturing and decision making? IT and OT, they need to come together. They are coming together. 
they need to continue to come together, um, bringing that, that perspective that they each have and their roles that they each have and bringing that together to be able to have more time sensitive networks, communication protocols, the whole OPCUA is certainly helping with some of the, those standards and regulations. So over half of the participants that we talked to in this survey said, yes, our departments are starting to collaborate better and work together and, and not hindering the advancement of automation. So robotics is really no longer just a tool. It's really transforming and, and revolutionizing manufacturing. Um, in the next five years, we have a prediction here from an industry uh, expert working in the academic world that robotics is really going to drive um, a whole new system with richer algorithms, dynamic maneuverability, force control, and it'll have inherent safety. It, it will have the sensors and it will know when someone has entered into its workspace. So in 2019, which is the research that we've just done in robotics, four out of the five companies say they are using robots somewhere on their line and they will continue to use more robots as the costs decrease. There's 35, over 35,000 robots now deployed in the US, which is, which is a 15% growth rate, significant growth in robots. Particularly in the life sciences area, they've seen tremendous growth, and they've also seen tremendous growth in the CPG food beverage area. Um, where along the line, uh, in the front of the line, there's more robots, cobots being deployed, certainly in the, the packaging area, the primary packaging area, and then the secondary packaging where palletizing, case packing, that's where robots started, automation started, it, it's continuing to increase. We hear several companies, they'll say, we're 100%, our, our operations are completely <coughs> automated and robotic. So robotics is really a key for pneumatics and vacuum technology. As we know, their end effector is, is oftentimes, most oftentimes, uh, a pneumatic function. Um, robot hand and arm integrated with AI really enables um, human, human interaction. And they're able to work in tight spaces, maximum flexibility, gives the manufacturing floor unbelievable now control over what they're looking at. Special purpose machinery section, when, when we looked at this um, from the NFPA, they have a section that's called the, the special purpose machinery, which is where robotics lands. And they're showing some significant growth, double digit growth in that particular area. So you're, you're seeing an uptick just from the driving and the increase of robotic usage. So robotics is often associated with lighter loads and, and repetitive motion. Same for robotics, um, significantly reduces maintenance, allows for precision and smooth movements, movements comparatively lower risk, operates in extreme temperatures. So there are certainly reasons why the pneumatic aspect of robotics will continue. <clears throat> We're hearing more about soft robotics where they have the sensors now to be able to pick up uh, uh, smaller objects, more delicate objects, so in your medical kit, assemblies, robots and cobots are playing a, a much more significant role. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cobots are programmed to assist safely. They have stop-start capabilities. They have sensors now. They even, the technology is coming where the operator might have sensors in his helmet, sensors in his shoes, sensors in his shirt, where he's communicating with that robot. So he, work, he moves into that work cell that robot goes into safe mode, stops its operation, and waits until it's now in a, it's realized that that object has moved out of its path, and then it will resume and continue on with its operations. So there is that concern of robots typically have been caged and, and not, you can't enter their workspace. That's changing in terms of the technology now that it can actually operate more in safe mode and can operate in a work cell with humans. In adaptive handling, they're able to pick up, like I just said, pick up more delicate objects without crushing them. Um, advanced end of arm tooling is certainly um, introducing robotics in many different areas. Machine learning and vision, 
where it's able to um, have the, the technology and, and the smarts to be able to say, I am doing this task this way, but now I've done it so often, I can now understand I could correct myself and I can learn from this um, and, and be able to go forward and, and change and become even more efficient. So the whole um, Ethernet certainly is, is the uh, platform that's being most used for data exchange. But everything is connected. So if we look at that, some companies are sending data to the edge, which is within their facility. Now there's something called the fog, which is in between that and the edge and the cloud. And, and some companies are sending it to the cloud. So maybe the next step is then we actually just send it to heaven. And that's where it's, all our data is going to reside. I mean, it's just going further and further and further out in terms of where this data is being housed. And, and then again, the, the whole cybersecurity, you've got to pay attention to that. But, and this is at a lot of different stages. I was at a conference yesterday that was specifically on, on automation and robotics as well. And there's a reluctancy of sending that data outside their manufacturing plant, the vulnerability that that begins to cause. But it's happening and it's occurring and, and the systems are being put in place to make it as safe as possible. Um, two out of three OEMs predict using more network-enabled pneumatics and components in the years ahead. Um, certainly uh, greater than, so the way you kind of look at this, it's greater than 50% say, um, yes, we're going to be continuing to use more um, network-enabled pneumatic components, certainly being driven by robotics and automation. So the ability to um, have that machine connectivity, this is another area where it depends on the company you talk to. But to look at this, about three out of four companies are allowing remote access in some form, whether that's through a secure network, they turn it on and off, whether it's now becoming through a digital twin. But everyone is doing a little bit, and everyone predicts to allow it even more. Because they realize to send a service technician out every time something is needed isn't efficient, and it isn't cost effective anymore. So adopting that digital twin and that remote access is something that the industries will continue to move forward towards. And these slides are available to you later, so um, it's not something that you have to read everything on the slide. Oh, thank you. So let's kind of look at the future. Where is technology going um, in the years ahead? So we heard that OEMs recommend the performance improvements. What, what are they looking for? Improved durability and robustness, certainly. Um, greater energy efficiency in all of their components and their machinery. And it's got to be available, and it's got to be delivered on time. So they're going to move on to the next component manufacturer, the next supplier, if they can't get what they need, because uptime is needs to be all the time. Um, so some of the comments, they need better positioning, they're looking for smaller components, they're looking for greater efficiency, they're looking for pick and place applications and expect faster response time. So certainly some of the things to be able to keep in mind as you're working with these companies. So embracing automation, the growth of smart manufacturing. So we hear smart manufacturing, smart components. Um, everything is going to have that level of intelligence to collect data, be connected, analyze that data, and then be able to begin to apply that data directly. So the four key components of smart technology or smart factory is it's, it's got to be efficient. It has to still be safe. You still have to have worker safety. It's got to be flexible, and it's got to be connected. So those four key points is what's really driving automation. And about a third of the OEMs that we spoke to in this research really say, yes, our machines are ready. They're smart. They're connected. They're integrated. And they're ready. So again, that leaves a lot of white space and improvement for OEMs to be able to come up to speed with providing smart machines and smart robotics. So machine learning, we hear about this AI, uh, artificial intelligence. It's, it's definitely detects inefficiencies. It, there are all kinds of things, machine learning, 
training, lots of things that AI is going to, we're going to hear about AI in our lives for, for the rest of our lives. Smart components certainly advancing the abilities for air technology. It's data-driven manufacturing as we continuously hear. So what do we really look at? What can we have as a takeaway from this in terms of, you know, you've got to be automation ready. You have to help educate the industry in terms of helping them understand where do we put automation, where will it be most efficient, where do we put a robot or a cobot that's really going to help us increase production and increase uptime. Innovate for the future, really foster that, that whole innovation phase, that whole innovation thinking. If this is where we are at today, where are we going to be at tomorrow? Because it's not going to be where we are today. Think of the development of our smartphones. We don't even know where that's going to eventually go, but maybe we're going to have to have it embedded in our arm because if you lose your phone nowadays, um, you just about lost everything you own. So having that device somehow more accessible to us or more um, readily available and, and less likely to be um, uh, compromised, all these things are the same in our personal lives with that and as well as in manufacturing. Think globally. It, it, we're, not a, we're not a us and overseas anymore. We're, we're a global world. Um, and, you, and we need to begin to think that way and, and act that way. And then the whole workforce development is significant to be able to upskill the workers that we have and bring more engineers and more training and, and more sophistication to the jobs that, that are out there. So automated um, smart manufacturing, it's really for the customization of one in the automotive industry. We know that already occurs. You get a car made exactly the way you want it the color that you want it, with any components that you want it, without, with, with any frills that you want on it, you get your car made going down the manufacturing line. Well, that same concept is coming into the CPG market. Because maybe you want to get a beverage and you don't want to buy a 12 pack of one beverage, you want two of every flavor in that package. And that's what's driving a lot of this change in this manufacturing of one now, is to be able to accommodate that efficiently where they don't have to send that out to now a secondary warehouse for it to be broken down and repacked into multiple packs or variety packs. So a lot of our buying habits are driving a lot of this automation as well. So what's a game changing? <clears throat> it's definitely e-com, like I've been speaking about this morning. It, it's driving the change of how our CPGs have to manufacture their products. The whole omni-channel, um, PMMI has done a significant report on e-com. Right now we're working on the omni-channel, which is, which is, took us a little bit of, of time to figure out what are they, what is the omni-channel? I'll give you sort of a, a quick overview because it's not just e-com. It's also the channels in which we operate. So we could go on our smartphone and look at a product and then maybe we'll stop at the store to see what it looks like. But then when we get home, maybe we'll order that product on our desktop. And then when we want it delivered, we want it delivered to our house, or maybe we'll pick it up, or maybe we want it delivered to the trunk of our car, or we want it delivered to a storage unit. So all of this that is occurring, which has really been driven by, the, by this Amazon effect, although many other companies are involved in it, is, is really driving this channel of change of how we get our products, where we see our products, how do we get them delivered, and then how do we return them? So Amazon's return policy now is you can go to a brick and mortar, go to Kohl's, and you can return your product, and it ends up back at the manufacturer. Amazon wants more products deployed directly from the manufacturers. So all of this is changing, and automation and robotics is something that's helping this happen. So I thank you for your time today. Um, I don't know, is there any time for if there's any questions, or I'm, I'm certainly here through the rest of your uh, conference, so if you have any questions directly, I'd be happy to chat with you. Thank you very much.
for, for hydraulics, electrification has, has displaced it somewhat, especially in industrial environments, but there are applications where it can never be swapped with its high power density. Um, do you see any pneumatic applications that absolutely cannot be replaced by a hydraulic in automation? I think that yes. I mean, I, I, I can't name them, but from what we've heard and all the research that we've done, yes, pneumatics will have a place in the market. And, and particularly, as I had said, you're seeing an uptick. I don't know how, you know, who in the room has seen that uptick, but it, robotics is increasing significantly. It, it's, it's seen double digit growth, and pneumatics is in those robotics. So it's in the end of arm tooling. So as, as you see that growth, it's going to continue to grow. So maybe we were talking with the NFPA about this, you know, maybe there's something, there's technology that, that because in the future these robots are going to be untethered. So how do you untether something that's tied to, to an airline? And maybe that now needs to become mobile. It needs to move with that robot. So all new concepts to be able to think about is if, if robots are going to be in our future, and they are going to be in our future, they are in our, they are in our present right now, how do then, how does pneumatics keep up with that if, if that robot now wants to be deployed from one line to another? More questions? Hi, Donna, you spoke about uh, digital twinning. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious about that in terms of, uh, can you speak about a practical application or the tools that one can use to enable it? Sure. So digital twinning, um, think of a twin, like if you're a person, you have a twin. So it's hence how somehow it got named that. So you could look at it. Um, there's two applications that are significantly growing. One is at the design application. So you can actually design that machine um, in, a, in a 3D modeling format far before you ever get to um, fabricating that so that you can see how it works, what's it doing, what's its, you know, how is it going to operate. Then once it gets in the manufacturing environment, now you have like, think of it being exactly a twin. So you've got a tablet and you've got your machine and you don't even need to be in the same place. You could be at the OEM. You can be watching that machine operating. So we had an example described yesterday. Um, there was a motor that kept dying too prematurely and and they kept having this problem and they couldn't understand why so they set the whole thing up with digital twinning and they were able to see that with and they didn't see it in the design there was too much torque going on and it was causing that motor to die out faster than it should so when they looked at that whole machine operating in a digital twin environment that's when they noticed it they could easily now make that correction and the problem was solved so it's really, it's looking at your machine. Or the other application that can be is, if, you're, if you've got a, just a maintenance, preventive maintenance too, it can pinpoint and direct you to the problem. So it's, what it's doing is it's really shortening that time frame to be able to say a, a, as an operator or as someone, as a technician there to um, service that machine, what exactly is happening, and, and that's what the digital twin will actually do. It will bring you to the problem versus you having to come and diagnose the problem. It will pinpoint where it is that maintenance is needed. There was a whole entire uh, session um, at the conference I was at yesterday just on digital twinning for people to begin to understand how to use it, how to actually implement it, and, and, and just how to get started. All right, we time for one more, anyone? All right, well, thank you, Donna. I think we got one more. One more? I got a great presentation. Uh, this is a narrow question. I'm not sure if you can answer it. Maybe it's something we can talk about you know, afterward. But I'm a cylinder manufacturer. We put you know, some sensors into our cylinders. But I'm curious, from a match perspective, any idea of what people are looking for in terms of sensors that they want to have you know, embedded inside the cylinder portion of 
Hmm, that is really specific. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't have an exact answer for that other than the, the type of sensors that are most common are going to be temperature, vibration sensors that can actually um, look at the, you know, understand what the machine is going through. So, I mean, those would be the first common um, moisture, if there's any moisture in that. So those are the most common sensors that we're hearing about. So it, one of the things that, that we hear is just get started. Put sensors on your machine, just get started. Just understand what's the temperature. Is your product fluctuating in terms of output just because of the temperature of, of the environment or the vibration of the machine, um, the speed of the machine? So some of the simple things that you can begin to look at might be a place where you begin to start to automate. All right, thank you. Let's give thank you. Another round of applause.